Becoming the greatest footballer of all time, or the GOAT, for a single club is extremely difficult. Most football clubs are steeped in history and tradition. Yeah, alright, not them. Many of them are over a hundred years old, and with as many as a thousand different players who have represented them over the years. Even some of the greatest players of all time, like Lota Mateus, Marco Van Basten, and the Brazilian Ronaldo, probably aren't the single greatest players of all time for any of the teams that they represented. Becoming the greatest player of all time for multiple teams, therefore, ought to be practically impossible, as not only would you have to have been utterly brilliant and remarkably consistent, you would also have had to have split enough of your career between at least two different teams for that to even be possible. There are lots of players who are among the greatest players of all time at multiple clubs, Jimmy Greaves at Tottenham and Chelsea, Johan Cruyff at Ajax and Barcelona, and Kenny Dalglish with Liverpool and Celtic, just to give three examples. But I don't think that Greaves spent quite long enough at Chelsea to earn him GOAT status, Cruyff would miss out, certainly to Lionel Messi now at Barca, and whilst Dalglish comes close, even if you have him ahead of Gerrard at Liverpool, which I think I would, few Celtic fans would rank him ahead of Jimmy Johnston. Some of you might point to Cristiano Ronaldo, but even if you would call him Real Madrid's GOAT, ahead of Alfredo Di Stefano, which I think is a reasonable claim, but by no means a settled debate, I would seriously struggle to put him ahead of the likes of George Best, Bobby Charlton, or even Roy Keane at Manchester United. Right, well, it can't be done then, Alfie. I hear you cry. And just a few days ago, I might have agreed with you. But after pouring blood, sweat, and tears into my research, admittedly the blood, only because I blew my nose too hard after sneezing, I think that I have found seven players who fit the bill. And, incredibly, one player who I think is arguably the GOAT for an incredible four different clubs. Would you believe that? Well, you better had, because it's true. Without further ado then, here are seven footballers who I think could make very strong cases to have been the greatest player of all time for multiple different football clubs. Seventh, Zico. If it wasn't for Diego Maradona playing during roughly the same era, I wholeheartedly believe that Zico would be considered one of the greatest players of all time. And if it wasn't for Maradona's stunning 1986 World Cup, while Zico failed to win a World Cup with Brazil, I think that people would struggle to split them. Zico was not a teenage superstar like Maradona, but at the age of 26, he scored 65 goals in 51 games for Flamengo from attacking midfield, in one of the most extraordinary seasons in the entire history of the sport. Zico once said that he felt as though he had been given a gift from God in terms of his talent for playing football, and he therefore felt a sense of responsibility to work hard and to make good use of it. The fact that he went on to be nicknamed the White Pele suggests that he did just that. And whilst the World Cup would be cruel to him, preventing him from matching Brazilian legends like Pele's legacy on the international stage, his club career was superb. Zico was Flamengo's star man during the team's golden generation in the early 1980s, winning six state championships, three Brasileiro titles, a Copa Libertadores crown, and an Intercontinental Cup, in which he tore European champions Liverpool to shreds in a man-of-the-match winning performance in a 3-0 win. The diminutive Brazilian, who is one of the sport's best ever set-piece specialists, went on to star in Syria with Udinese before playing a decisive role in the development of Japanese football. Flamengo have had no lack of world-class players over the years, from Gerson and Zazinho to Leonidas and Romario, but Zico is the best of the lot. He is also, I think, though it is a little harsh on Mitsu Ogasawara, who played far more games for the club, Kashima Antler's greatest player of all time. Zico joined the club when they were named Sumitomo Metals, a small town club in Japan's second division. In his debut campaign, age 39, Zico scored 22 goals in 24 games to fire Sumitomo to promotion. Sumitomo rebranded as Kashima Antlers following promotion where, despite their modest budget and size, they won the J-League Suntory series and finished as top-flight runners-up. Without Zico, 
there would be no Kashima Antlers as the club is now, hence why a statue of him has been erected outside of the club's ground, and why, for my money at least, he is both Flamengo and Kashima Antlers, greatest player of all time. Sixth, Eusebio. At least up until the last 10 years, and the exploits of Cristiano Ronaldo, the answer to the question, who is the greatest Portuguese, and who is the greatest Mozambican footballer of all time, was the same. Eusebio. That must surely earn Eusebio the unique distinction of being the greatest footballer in the history of both two different countries and two different football clubs. Whilst Eusebio was born in Mozambique, which was a Portuguese colony at the time, it wasn't until 1975, following a decade of brutal armed conflict between the Mozambique Liberation Front and their European oppressors, the Mozambique finally won its independence. By that time, Eusebio had already been retired from international football for two years, having scored 41 goals from just 64 caps for Portugal between 1961 and 1973. Eusebio was mixed race, born to a white and golden father and a black Mozambican mother, and raised in crippling poverty. He learned to play football barefoot, and he began his career in the capital of Mozambique with C.D. Mashiken. Between the ages of 15 and 18, Eusebio scored a quite incredible 77 goals in 42 games for the Mashikan first team. Although he left at the age of only 18, and Mashikin are five-time Mozambican champions, the club is synonymous with Eusebio, and few would argue that he is the club's greatest player of all time. Eusebio joined Benfica in 1961, a controversial transfer given that Mashikan were at the time a feeder club for Benfica's great rivals sporting. It would prove to be the single most important signing that Benfica ever made, and the biggest missed opportunity in the history of sporting. Over the next 14 years, Eusebio scored 473 goals in 440 games for Benfica, winning 11 league titles and a European Cup, becoming the greatest centre forward in Europe and the first black player to win the Ballon d'Or in 1965. Eusebio is, comfortably in my eyes, the greatest player in the history of both Mashakan and undoubtedly Benfica. And you could probably throw Toronto Blizzard in there as well, though that one is a little bit more debatable. Fifth, Ken Wagstaff. Mixing it up a bit following two global superstars and all-time greats of the sport, never mind specific clubs, this one I can back up with hard data. Well, sort of. In the year 2000, every football league team carried out a poll among their supporters who voted to name their club's player of the century. There was only one man who came out in top spot for two different football league teams. And that man, you guessed it, was Ken Wagstaff. Whilst he might not quite be Zico or Eusebio, Waggy, as he was affectionately known, was a man of many talents. Sought after by Brian Clough during his time at Derby County, Wagstaff was widely regarded as one of the best players outside of the first division throughout his career, and one of the finest never to have been capped by England. Despite plenty of interest over the years, Wagstaff only ever played for two English clubs, Mansfield Town and Hull City, followed by a brief stint as player-manager in Australia. Wagstaff scored 91 goals in 183 league games for Mansfield and 197 goals in 434 games for Hull City in all competitions, as one of the most prolific goal scorers for both clubs during the post-war era. Waggy wasn't just a fantastic goal scorer. He was strong, explosive, and had real skill on the ball. His goals fired Mansfield Town to promotion to Division 3, and his partnership with Chris Chilton was the most fondly remembered period of Hull City's history before the turn of the millennium. There have been more gifted Hull City players, Rach Carter, Neil Franklin, JJ Okocha, and those who have achieved more, perhaps most notably Ian Ashby. But as a combination of the two, there remains a compelling argument that Ken Wagstaff is the Tigers' greatest player of all time, and therefore the GOAT for the only two professional teams that he ever represented. Fourth, Arthur Rowley. 
Taking a step a little bit further back in time, I hope you will forgive me for the lack of images of Arthur Rowley in the Getty Images database for this segment, but I assure you that his career and talents more than make up for it. From this point onwards, if ever a relevant image isn't available, I will instead display an image of Peter Andre and Katie Price from the period of 2004 to 2009 whilst they were still together, for what I would imagine are very obvious reasons. Happier times, simpler times, or just time, which was Andre's unsuccessful follow-up to his breakout album, Natural, that saw him take a seven-year break from the music industry, or the Dark Ages, as they are more commonly known within the business. Arthur Rowley holds the record for having scored the most league goals in the entire history of English football, which is a pretty impressive record to have in the oldest league system on the planet. In total, Rowley scored 434 goals in 619 games, or 0.7 goals per game on average, over a period of 19 years, for four different clubs. That record is made all the more impressive when one considers that the beginning of Rowley's career was actually delayed by World War II, which meant that league football didn't return until he was already 20 years old. The youngest player to ever play in the Manchester United first team, at just 15 years and 5 days of age, in a wartime fixture, Rowley joined West Bromwich Albion in 1946, Fulham in 1948, and Leicester City in 1950. Rowley had scored prolifically for Fulham in the second division, but had struggled in the top flight, and over the next four years, he scored a ludicrous number of goals at Filbert Street, and this time, following promotion, he would carry that form into the first division. Rowley scored 265 goals in 321 games for the Foxes in total, somehow managing never to win a cap for England, before signing for Shrewsbury Town as a player manager at the age of 32. Rowley was still a sensational footballer with one of the most lethal left feet in the football league at that age, and his job as manager was made much, much easier thanks to him himself scoring 38 goals in just 43 games to fire the Shrews to promotion during his first season in charge. In total, Rowley bagged 167 goals in 267 games for Shrewsbury, and he was their top scorer in each of the next five seasons. Arguments can be made in favour of Gordon Banks, Gary Lineker, or Jamie Vardy being Leicester City's GOAT, among many others but Rowley's case is as strong as just about anyone's, and I think he is well worth a spot in this seven. Third, Diego Maradona. Mentioned earlier on, in the context of Zico, whilst the Brazilian had greater longevity, many people would consider Diego Maradona's peak to be the closest that any professional footballer has ever come to perfection. Those people obviously didn't see Boaz Myhill's performance to keep a clean sheet against Tottenham Hotspur at White Hart Lane in 2010, but there can be no doubt that Maradona was still very good at football. He is the greatest player, of course, to have played for every club that he has ever played for, with the possible exception of Barcelona. But that is different to being the greatest player for a specific club. I hope that makes sense. In that respect, I think that Maradona can point to two teams where he has GOAT status, namely Argentinos Juniors and Napoli. Argentinos Juniors were Maradona's first club, and it is difficult to put it in words just how special a teenage talent Maradona was, and how immediately he became a superstar. In the 1978 season, for example, which Maradona spent most of as a 17-year-old, he scored 26 goals, and in his final season with Albico, before signing for Boca Juniors at the age of 20, he struck 43 times in 45 games. Maradona, it is worth emphasising, was never a centre forward, and he was just as good at creating goals as he was at dispatching them. Four years after leaving Argentinos Juniors, Maradona set a world record fee for the second time in a move to Napoli. It was a transfer which sent shockwaves through the world of football, since Napoli had finished just one point above the Serie A relegation zone the previous season, and had never won the Scudetto. Following a tumultuous spell at Barcelona, though, Maradona seemed to revel in his status as Napoli's undisputed star man, taking the club 
in the space of just three short seasons from relegation candidates to title winners. You would do well to find an Argentinos Juniors or Napoli fan who doesn't worship Maradona, let alone merely consider him to be their club's greatest ever player. So, there was no real way in which I could leave him out. No real way? Is that proper English? Doesn't sound like it, but you know what I mean. I did both English language and literature at A-level. What a colossal waste of time. Second, Stanley Matthews. Arguably still the greatest player that English football has ever produced, 107 years on from his birth and 57 years on from his retirement, the mathematicians among you will have worked out very quickly from that, that Stanley Matthews was 50 years old when he hung up his boots. Yet, he famously only half-joked that he retired too young and that he still had a good couple of years left in him. Matthews was a man whose diet and nutrition was several decades ahead of its time. He was a teetotal vegetarian before most people even knew what either of those words meant, and his training regime would make even modern footballers think that he had lost the plot. The result was remarkable longevity and consistency, though it would do Matthews a disservice to talk about him as though those were his most remarkable attributes. A wizard with the ball at his feet, who was literally nicknamed the Wizard of the Dribble, Pele once described Matthews as the man who taught the world the way in which football should be played. Outside of a couple of loan moves to Canada, Matthews only ever officially played competitively for two professional football clubs. His hometown club of Stoke City, where he spent 19 years, and Blackpool, where he spent 14 years. Just saying those numbers sounds ridiculous, since 14 and 19 years is effectively two very decent-sized careers all of their own for a professional footballer. Matthews is, by far and away, the greatest player ever to have played for either club, having won the FWA Footballer of the Year award at Stoke and both the FWA Footballer of the Year award and the Ballon d'Or at Blackpool. Remarkably, Matthews was just 24 years old when World War II broke out, meaning that the war effectively robbed him of six or seven of his very best years. Or so you might have thought. In reality, Matthews went on to tear the greatest left-back in the world, if not of all time, namely Nilton Santos, to shreds in his prime, whilst Matthews was in his 40s. He is a man without peer, at Stoke City, at Blackpool, and in the history of the sport. First, Gunnar Nordahl. In top spot, just as I promised, is a man who arguably is the greatest footballer of all time for four different football clubs. A man whose name isn't brought up nearly often enough in general conversations around the greatest footballers and certainly strikers of all time, Gunnar Nordahl was as close to total perfection in a centre forward as any footballer has probably ever come. Quick, technically proficient and incredibly strong, Nordahl was prolific from any range with either foot and with his head. The most prolific goal scorer in the history of the Italian game, Nordahl struck 225 times in 291 games for AC Milan and Roma. And he also holds the record for winning the league's most golden boots with five in total. Nordahl only arrived at AC Milan shortly before turning 28 though, and prior to that, he scored 149 goals in 172 games in Sweden for Hornefors, Dergefors, and Norrköping. And I do apologise to all Swedish viewers since I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that I just butchered at least two of those pronunciations, if not all three. It is for those three clubs that I think Nordahl is undoubtedly the GOAT, and a strong case could be made for AC Milan as well though Franco Baresi and Paolo Maldini would certainly run him close. A fitting top spot, I hope that you would agree, and I suppose it is worth adding that Nordahl scored 43 goals in just 33 games for Sweden at international level, and I would have no hesitation in describing him as Sweden's greatest player of all time. Not just that, he doesn't even pretend that he's a lion all the time on Instagram, which, you know, helps. That is it for today's video. Thank you all very much as of for watching. 
Hit the like button if you enjoyed it, I sincerely hope that was the case. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on for HITC7s. You can also find me on Twitter and on Instagram via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so.